Tips to save time, tips to save money, wholesome tips, disgraceful tips, tips to give you the ick, and tips to incite a mass brawl. Hi, I'm a frugal Brit, and in this video, I'll be providing all my best tips for visiting Universal Orlando Resort, including updated strategies on how best to tackle Hagrid's and Velocicoaster for the busy summer months using all my nerdy data I've researched. Probably too many tips, unless you're aiming for the best possible trip. Tip number one is to make sure you understand the basics. So knowing about early park admission, where to buy tickets, park to park tickets, express passes, parking, transportation, all the simple stuff I won't cover in a pro tips guide. I did recently do an idiot's guide to Universal Orlando, which I'll link to in the video description if you need a refresh of the basics. I'm also gonna leave a planning checklist in the video description as well. I do want to emphasize the obvious but crucial tip you've all heard a million times before, which is to arrive at least 30 minutes before official opening time if you wanna cram in as much as possible in one day. You do have to factor in how long it takes to park up and walk over from City Walk. So yeah, need to understand the basics. I promise these tips will get less basic as the video goes on, but gotta cover all bases. Tip number two is to get the most out of the Universal Orlando app. We're in an age now where I think most people will have the app all set up before visiting, but I suspect there's many that don't take advantage of all its functionality. Starting with tickets, there are benefits to having a physical ticket or pass, but you can also add it onto the app, which many find more convenient. I tend to use both, to be honest. Another tip is to use the app for the most up-to-date opening hours. Universal just changed its opening hours throughout the year, and I've heard their website is not updated as quickly as the app. You really don't want to arrive to the park at the wrong time, speaking from experience, so be sure to check the correct opening times the night before your visit. The main use, I think, for the Universal app is to check attraction wait times and viewing the park maps. You may be interested to know that you can also filter the map to only show certain things, such as restaurants, restrooms and lockers, etc. You can do this by selecting change category when in the map. Mobile ordering is another service provided by the app, which helps you save time waiting at one of these qualifying restaurants. Be warned though, it doesn't always go smoothly. I've heard bad things about Mel's driving in particular, but for the most part, works pretty well. Extra tip here is to save time when you're in a queue by browsing and ordering from the menu so that you can be on a ride whilst they're preparing your meal. Last thing on the app is to make use of the wait time alert feature. This is handy when your favorite ride is showing an unreasonable wait time and you're keen to take advantage as soon as the queue calms down. When using this, you'll get a notification as soon as it falls below the selected wait time. Tip number three, stay at a Universal Hotel Resort is what most guys will say, but I'm actually gonna say, don't stay at a Universal Hotel Resort if you're not gonna benefit much from the perks. Don't get me wrong, I absolutely love the Universal Hotels. I did an entire series reviewing all of them a few months ago. The transportation is incredible, so much better than Disney. You can walk to the parks from all hotels except Endless Summer. But they are really expensive now. Prices have gone up massively over the past year. I think I paid an extra 40% for Cabana Bay this year compared to last after a lot of shopping around. I know there's a lot of people that won't be planning to spend much time at all at their hotel and want to save money for other things. Early park admission, one of the main perks, does have its limitations. You can only use it for Islands of Adventure on most days, which is limited to Velocicoaster and the Wizarding World. If you have any kids too young for these rides, then the benefits are reduced significantly. Also, I know a lot of people simply just don't want to get up that early. Unlimited Express Passes is the other big perk for the Premier Resorts, but these prices have gone up so much now that the old trick of reserving a Premier Resort for one night to get two days worth of Express Passes for your whole group is not as attractive as it once was. My take with Express Passes is that they're a good way to plan a trip when you're short on time in the parks, but they don't offer great value. Confession time, unless it's for content reasons or if I'm visiting with the family, I do find it hard to resist saving a fortune by staying at one of the not-so-luxurious Rosen Inn hotels on International Drive, which has free parking and no resort fees. Far from perfect, but it's often all that I need when I'm visiting, mainly to film at the parks. When staying off-site though, you will need to factor in Uber or parking charges at Universal, as none of the off-site hotels offer bus services comparable to the Universal shuttle buses. If you do plan to use Uber or Lyft, one sneaky tip is that you can get dropped off at the Hard Rock Hotel instead of City Walk, which saves quite a bit of time. It can also be quite a bit cheaper for some reason. For number four, my tip is to pack light with a small to medium sized backpack. This is because you'll need to store all your belongings in lockers for many of the park's attractions and the free ones are not that big. With a bit of encouragement though, you can fit more in here than you'd think, but obviously a lot easier if you pack as light as possible. To use the locker, you can scan your park ticket or annual pass and you'll be directed to your chosen locker. 
A lot of Universal fans will use lanyards for their tickets to make this process easier. Taking a fanny pack bum bag is a good tip, as you can keep your phone and wallet etc whilst on the ride, although not for the big roller coasters with metal detectors, as you'll need to put everything inside the locker for these. If you do need a bigger locker, you'll have to pay $2 each time you use these. One thing I do want you to be careful of, there's this naughty hack that some people do, which is that anything with a barcode can be used for gaining additional small lockers for free. For example, a hotel key or a SeaWorld ticket can be used. Now that you're aware of this, it should be easier for you to avoid. Tip number five is to plan your dining at Universal. Now the obvious thing here is to make sure you get your restaurant reservations in. Usually seven days is enough to get whichever restaurant you need, but I'd recommend at least two weeks if you can. You can just show up on the day for many restaurants, but be prepared to wait a while during peak times. Fortunately, the situation with the reservations is nowhere near as bad compared to Disney World, but then again, there is quite a big quality difference, which some might say would justify it. When planning your dining, worth bearing in mind that City Walk is not far from the parks, of course, so you might want to reserve one of those restaurants where there's better variety. For those with limited time at the parks, you do need to bear in mind that the restaurants take up quite a long time out of your day. I tend to avoid getting breakfast at the parks, as that time is better spent getting on rides before the crowds arrive. It's also a good way to save money. Most of the time, I'll grab something light in the hotel room, then something more substantial around 11 before the queues fill up. Unless you have a reservation, best to avoid eating between 11.30 and 2. I did provide a rundown of the best dining choices in the Idiot's Guide, so I won't repeat this here. For those with a small appetite looking to save some money, I recommend ordering from the kids' menus as portions are quite substantial. Next, I'm going to give some tips on the Coke freestyle machines, which can be a good way to save on drinks. Whilst I don't think it's permitted, I know many families will buy one freestyle cup, which you can refill every 10 minutes and dispense into smaller cups for everyone in the family. These collapsible cups are very popular at the moment. I've got some for my next trip. For extra savings, you can just use these machines for their free ice water. Something else that is completely free is subscribing to the channel to be notified of future Universal videos. And if you found this video useful so far, do consider hitting the like button to support the channel. A little tip for anyone staying at a Universal hotel, be warned that if you try and get a Starbucks first thing in the morning before the parks open, you're going to be in that queue for a hell of a long time. I recommend saving a Starbucks trip until the midday when queues should be shorter in the parks. For early park admission days, I tend to jump in the queue as soon as my alarm goes off whilst the missus gets the kids ready. For those looking to enjoy an alcoholic beverage or two when inside the parks, I'll give you a couple recommendations for the best places to get a drink. In Universal Studios, there's the Finnegan's Bar and Grill, which has the best drinking atmosphere. You've also got Shea Alcatraz on the wooden docks of San Francisco's Fisherman's Wharf, serving the Shark Attack cocktail. On the opposite side of the park, there's the Moe's Bar in Springfield, as well as the Duff Brewery. In Diagon Alley, you've got the Hopping Pot. Over in Islands of Adventure, near the entrance, you have the Backwater Bay in the Port of Entry, connected to Confisco Grill. And in Jurassic Park, there's the Watering Hole, specialising in tropical-inspired mixed drinks. My short tip for number six is don't hurl on the rides. Universal is less accommodating to those with motion sickness compared to most other theme parks in my opinion. If you suffer with this, I'd be careful with some of their simulator screen rides. Here's my ranking of most likely to make you feel sick, but your mileage may vary. I do personally really struggle with Forbidden Journey, the bit when you get swung into the Quidditch pitch absolutely destroys me. I tend to close my eyes at this part. Thankfully, Escape from Gringotts in Diagon Alley is a lot more comfortable. If you are worried about motion sickness, I recommend picking up some Dramamine before your visit. Or you can always ask one of the employees at first aid who I'm sure can give you some. For number seven, I'll controversially recommend that you wear Crocs. Hear me out, I know they look dreadful, but they are the perfect footwear for a theme park. Just not the coolest looking. Comfy, easy to get on, super convenient for the kids. Hygiene is a common complaint with Crocs, I believe, which I don't really understand as they're so easy to wash. The main benefit in the parks for me is that you don't need to stress when getting on a water ride. When you're wearing trainers, sneakers, tennis shoes, whatever you call them, if they get soaked, you're going to have to deal with everything being soggy until they dry, which is not what you want. With Crocs, you can just get on anything without a second thought. Anyway, to end this Crocs promo, which I'm not paid for in any way, I just recommend keeping an open mind extra points if you wear them with socks in the airport. Tip 8 is to decide on when to visit Universal Orlando, often the most impactful decision you can make. If low crowds are your priority, then I recommend September, early November and from the second week of January. Crowds are decent for most of August these days, but it's very hot with extra risk of hurricanes. I will link to a handy crowd calendar in the video description. 
If you've seen my Idiot's Guide, you'll be aware of these special events such as Halloween Horror Nights in September and October. In terms of the best day of the week to visit, the parks do definitely feel crowded at the weekends, but I was really surprised that the wait times don't always correspond with the crowd levels as much as you'd think, likely due to increased staffing at the weekend with better turnover on the rides, although I'm not entirely sure to be honest. If anyone knows, do let me know in the comments. But yeah, in terms of best day to visit the theme parks, Universal is at its quietest between Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday usually. For those that have multi-day tickets for both Disney World and Universal that cover the weekend, I probably recommend choosing Disney World at the weekend because of the reservation system that's still in use over there, which caps the attendance. Bizarrely, the wait times over there are quite often lower at the weekend. For number nine, my tip is to have a Hagrid's and Velocicoaster strategy. We'll start with Hagrid's. So based on the data, the best times to jump in the queue are at first thing at early park admission or within the last 20 minutes before park closure. But couple issues here, which are that getting to the park before anyone else at early park admission is quite inconvenient if we're being honest. You'll have to wait at the gate before you're allowed in. You do need to factor in this time and inconvenience. Hagrid's is also notoriously unreliable first thing in the morning, delays occurring quite often. If you don't have early park admission, my advice is to stay the hell away from that queue until the afternoon. Alternatively, you have the option of jumping in the Velocicoaster queue for early park admission. In my tips video last year, I didn't recommend doing this, but now that they've added Express Pass, doing Velocicoaster during rope drop clearly is the smarter choice, with queues growing massively from the mid-morning onwards. Even without early park admission, I'd recommend rope dropping Velocicoaster. So going back to Hagrid's, I do want to answer what I think is the best strategy for this ride. It's tempting to just say get in the queue for the last 20 minutes before closure, but this is risky due to reliability issues. Also, I personally think the ride looks better in the daytime and not always practical to stay that late. So with all this in mind, my next controversial tip for 2023 is to get in the Hagrid's queue between 2 and 4, despite this being typically the worst window for a theme park. The reason is that the wait times generally peak between early in the morning and midday, so it makes sense to queue for Hagrid's after its wait time peak and when all the other ride wait times are at their highest. There is obviously an argument for doing it during early park admission, which is what I've recommended in previous videos. I will say it's quite liberating to get it done before the park opens to day guests, but as mentioned, it comes at a cost. The next tip for number 10 is to get the most out of the Wizarding World of Harry Potter. So much to do, but easy to miss out on a lot of cool stuff if you're not prepared. Starting with early park admission in Hogsmeade, as we covered in the last tip, most people jump in the Hagrid's queue, but there are other options. It's a good time to do the Ollivander's one choosing experience. Little tip to help get your kid picked, get them to stand at the front and make as much eye contact as possible. Speaking of kids, one thing I do often recommend to parents is to avoid spending all the kids' gift budget before you get into the wizarding world. The official ones are not cheap at $60. They interact with shop windows and other objects which you may not want to miss out on. But if I'm being honest, not going to make or break your trip. If you do decide to purchase one and they don't seem to be working properly, which can happen if they've been dropped, you can go back into any store that sells them and they can easily get them fixed for you. At risk of sounding a bit cheap, one tip for any families on a budget is you can buy some inexpensive Harry Potter gifts on eBay, take them into the parks and then hand them out when exiting the ride in the gift shop. Over in Diagon Alley, one thing that's fairly easy to miss is the dark and foreboding Nocturne Alley mini walkthrough attraction next to the Leaky Cauldron, which features the shrunken heads and interactive one locations. Nocturne Alley is home to the Borgin and Burke store, which allows guests to peruse dark art artifacts. I think most watching this video will be aware of Butterbeer and the Wizarding World, but not everyone will know the different varieties. Universal recently announced a vegan option. For those super hot days, you have the frozen slushy version. And for those rare cold days, you can choose a hot Butterbeer, which is a sort of butterscotch hot chocolate. There are a couple non-beverage Butterbeer options. Over at the Florian Fortescue's Ice Cream Parlour, you can get Butterbeer soft serve ice cream laced with butterscotch swirl, also served at the Three Broomsticks. Lastly, you have Butterbeer flavoured fudge in Hogsmeade's Honey Dukes or Diagon Alley's Sugar Plum Sweet Shop. For those with a park to park ticket add-on, you can of course travel between the two theme parks via the Hogwarts Express. My tip here is that even during peak times, the queue rarely goes above 10 minutes in the morning. However, it grows dramatically over lunchtime and doesn't recover until the evening, so it makes sense to get this done early. Before we move on, I did want to give some photo tips. I think most people know about the photo spot on the bridge from Hogsmeade over to Jurassic Park. As an extra tip for this, the lighting is always better in the morning for all angles of the castle. 
A great photo opportunity that not many people know about can be found just after you exit the Hogwarts Express station in Hogsmeade. Before you head down the steps, you can get a great look at the steam engine on the platform. When in Diagon Alley, one of the most obvious photo spots is of the dragon on top of Gringotts Bank. Not everyone will know that the fire-breathing photo opportunity occurs every 10 minutes on the tens. For example, 2 o'clock, 10 past 2, 20 past 2 and so on. Also, the best views are arguably from the side. For number 11, my tip is to use the single rider line for those travelling solo or for anyone that doesn't mind splitting their group to save on time. So similar to Express Pass, many but not all the attractions will feature a separate single rider line to cut the main queue. Here's the list of attractions for each park that features a single rider line. A couple of things to make you aware of, you do often bypass great theming and backstory for many of these attractions. Escape from Gringotts being a good example of this, where you miss out on the Gringotts Bank lobby. Also, there are a couple of attractions where the amount of time saved is questionable, for instance, Hagrid's and Velocicoaster. I don't recommend it on these, but I will qualify this by saying I could be a bit out of date with this assessment as I haven't tested it for a while. If anyone is in the know, please share in the comments. But I think the general consensus is that there's less benefit for attractions with less than three people per row. With this in mind, Revenge of the Mummy and Forbidden Journey are known for having some of the best single rider lines, but you do miss out on a lot of theming inside the castle with the latter. Another option that guests have to save on queue time is the child swap service, which allows younger guests to skip a ride, often when they might not be tall enough, whilst giving everyone else in the party an opportunity to hop on the attraction without having to go through the queue all over again. I'll provide a link explaining how this works in the description. So those are the two ethical ways to skip the queues at Universal without having to pay for Express Pass. I know some groups will do that thing of having half the family get in a queue for a big ride, whilst the other half goes off to do other things before cutting back through the queue. Not a fan of this personally, which I don't think is a controversial take. I hear it was the cause of that massive brawl which occurred at Magic Kingdom last year, which wouldn't surprise me. Not that it would justify such a reaction. But since I'm giving tips, if you want to minimise the likelihood of inciting a mash brawl, I wouldn't try this. The twelfth and final tip for the video is to zig when others zag. Obviously quite a broad tip, which is pretty much the driving principle of any good theme park plan. But I am going to go into the specifics for what I'm confident will massively help out with planning for those that won't be spending a fortune on express passes. So what I mean by zig when others zag is that you want to make sure you're not falling for the same traps as the uninitiated. We'll start over in Islands of Adventure where this is more crucial. So during early park admission, Team Zag are going to flock over to Hogsmeade for Hagrid. As I've touched on, I don't think that's the smart thing to do unless you rope drop early park admission. I also mentioned Velocicoaster as being the first choice for early park admission or for rope dropping when the park opens. Another good plan is to do Spider-Man and Hulk Coaster whilst everyone is rushing to do the two headliners. On some days, you might be lucky enough to do Velocicoaster, Hulk Coaster and Spider-Man before the other lines fill up. And on super quiet days, you might be able to throw in a Toon Lagoon ride or two and all Reign of Kong. From the late morning, Seuss Landing will be at its busiest. One very transferable theme park tip is to leave any lands aimed for kids until the late afternoon, which is the best time to visit Seuss Landing. With this in mind, I do think a great plan for those with kids hoping to avoid burning out midday is to have a pretty relaxed day at the hotel pool, then head out to the park from the late afternoon when most of the kids have gone home. Not always practical though, I understand if you're staying for a short amount of time. Between the hours of one and four, you're gonna find the crowds are at their busiest. I recommend using this time to relax, watch a show, or have a pre-booked dining reservation. For those with young kids, highly recommend heading over to the Camp Jurassic multi-level interactive playground. Very often overlooked, but shouldn't be. The perfect place to burn an hour with kids when the wait times are high. This is where Pteranodon Flyers is found, but this is quite an awkward ride to plan around to be honest. The queues are okay until the mid-morning, but I think most people are going to do other things during this time. From then onwards, the wait times are absolutely dreadful and likely won't be worth it. From 4pm, many exhausted families will be leaving the park, which is the best time to hit any leftover rides. So moving over to Universal Studios, all the same principles apply when it comes to zigging when others are zagging. But the headliners here aren't anywhere near as popular as Velocicoaster and Hagrid's. Crowds are a lot more dispersed. Team Zag will head over to the Wizarding World at Rope Drop. I recommend doing Despicable Me, Minion Mayhem first thing, as long as you're early, followed by Rip Ride Rocket. 
Next, I'd head over to Escape from Gringotts. Ideally, you'd try Revenge of the Mummy on the way, but depends how successful the morning has gone. Again, the crowds will peak between one and four. I'd use this time for the Born Stuntacular, the Horror Makeup Show, E.T. Ride, and the unannounced DreamWorks Land that's closed for construction at the time of making this video. Then you can finish the remaining attractions when the crowds subside. So I've run out of tips, that's it for this video. I hope you found it useful. Always grateful if anyone has any extra tips to share in the comments. Always learning stuff from you guys. Last thing to say, if you're interested in future Universal Orlando or Disney World content, don't forget to subscribe.